So it's Pentecost Sunday. It, it, it's the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon Jesus' gathered disciples in Jerusalem. And they were blown out by the sound of rushing wind, by the movement of the Spirit. Jesus' disciples were moved and picked up and taken out into the world to share the good news of God's love for the world and tell people about what Jesus had done. And it is an incredible day in the life of the church because it is the birth date of the church. It's the day when the church actually started and when it began, and it began, began with incredible strength and incredible power. But I have to tell you, when I read this passage from the book of Acts, I can tell you one thing I know for certain, that it was not written by a Presbyterian. And here's how I know. It's not that Presbyterians didn't exist yet. It's because, I gotta skip through all these here, hang on. It's because, wait, there we go, oh, back. This, you know, technology is great until it's not. That's what I always say. Here's how I know it wasn't written by a Presbyterian. Because Presbyterians have this saying that all things should be done decently and in order. And when the disciples were sitting in that room in Jerusalem, when they felt the earth shake beneath their feet, when they heard the sound of a rushing wind, when the Holy Spirit was poured upon them, there was nothing decent or orderly about it. It was utterly and beautifully disordered. If a Presbyterian had written about Pentecost, here's what they would have said. It would have been like in 1 Kings 19 when Elijah heard the voice of the Lord. It would have gone something like this if it was written by Presbyterians. Then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord but of course the Lord was not in the wind because we're Presbyterians and God wouldn't do that. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake, of course not. We're Presbyterians. God wouldn't do that. It's not decent or in order. And after the earthquake, a fire, but come on. God wasn't in the fire. We follow the fire code. We know the rules. <laughs> Who are you kidding? But then the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, there was a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out. I think for Presbyterians... We would like to think that the Holy Spirit would be poured out not in wind and fire and earthquakes, but, but in a still, small voice. Quiet, meek, orderly, not going to upset your life, not going to upset the world, but everything would be decent and in order. But on Pentecost, there was nothing decent or orderly. The ground shook. Wind was rushing. The Spirit was blowing. God was pouring His Spirit out on His people, on the disciples there gathered in that room in Jerusalem. And there they were, experiencing the full power of the Holy Spirit. And what we found is that when the Spirit moves, God's people move. And they move out and into the world. And God's people got up and moved. Now, when you think about Pentecost, you know, as Presbyterians, we like to know, well, what's the history of Pentecost? So here you go. Pentecost means 50th. It's actually a translation from Hebrew into Greek, and then it's an Anglicization, Anglo whatever. We turn it into English, and we, we, we made it into this word Pentecost, which ultimately means 50th. And what 50th is, is it's the 50th day after the Passover, so what would happen is it was a festival day, and there were kind of two things that were happening. The first is it was right at kind of the beginning of the springtime harvest, because in Israel, they have two harvests. They have two growing seasons, and they have two harvesting seasons. So people would bring in their grain offerings, and they would offer them at the temple to the Lord. So it was a day of generosity and response to God's giving to us. And it also was a day when people were coming filled with gratitude and joy for what God was doing. It was as some New Testament scholars say, they say it kind of points to Pentecost and this first harvest that happens where 3,000 people turn to the Lord from the disciples preaching. They said that, you know, this is like the first fruits of God's rich harvest. 
And then there's the other side of it where they celebrate that on the 50th day, supposedly, after they were freed from the land of Egypt, Moses came down from Mount Sinai carrying the two tablets of the law, and the people were given these two tablets, and they were the, the, the rules and the ideas and the power that guided and led God's people as they went into the land that God had promised they were created as God's people. The covenant was given. And there are some New Testament scholars who like to say that what happened was that the Holy Spirit was given just like the law was given. And the Spirit animates us and guides us and leads us and instructs us as we ought to live as Christ's followers and as God's newly reconstructed people. Well, that's all well and good. But I think that's kind of looking at, looking at Pentecost from 30,000 feet. And the problem with Pentecost is you can't understand Pentecost from 30,000 feet. You can only understand Pentecost. You can only understand the Spirit's power when you see it from the ground. Actually, you can really only understand the Spirit's power when that Spirit blows through you and begins to work in you and change your life and uses you to change your community and change the world. And when we think about that first Pentecost, it started out when Jesus' disciples were still in Jerusalem and Jesus had been crucified and resurrected and he appeared to them and here's what he said. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus' disciples who were gathered in that room in Jerusalem were actually gathered there in obedience to Jesus. They were there waiting, anticipating that God would show up with power. You know, in some ways, that's sort of like us. I don't know if you think about this when you come to church on Sunday morning, but I know this is what Eric and I pray for. I know this is what other people pray for too. But as we gather here in this place, that that same spirit that fell upon Jesus' disciples in Jerusalem will fall upon us too. And that we will be animated empowered and driven out by that same spirit that animated, empowered, and drove Jesus' disciples out of that room where they were enclosed. But here's the other thing I want you to know about those 11 disciples in that room. I want you to think about who they were. It's not just the 11, actually. It was a whole group of Jesus' disciples, men and women, people, not just the 11, but but others who were there with them, gathered in that room, waiting and praying for the Lord to show up. Remember who these people were. They were the people who, when they saw Jesus on the cross, remembered all the other things they had to do, and they ran away. They were people like like Peter, who, when he was hanging off at a distance as Jesus was being put on trial, he too was being tried, and he was failing because he denied Jesus three times. These are the same people who followed Jesus throughout his ministry, and as he did these works of power, they scratched their heads saying, who could this possibly be? And when he said that he is the one to come, they thought, well, which one do you possibly mean? They were the disciples, the ones who who didn't get it, who didn't understand, who didn't quite see. And I think for us, that's actually a, a powerful notion. It's powerful because there are people here with us today who may have seen God at work, who may be skeptical that God is at work in the world at all. There may be people among us right here sitting next to you this morning who've heard all the stuff about Jesus and you're still not quite sure. These were the same people who were sitting in that room in Jerusalem. And yet God's spirit shook the ground and blew like a mighty wind filled them with his spirit and drove them out into the world. In Acts chapter 2, it says this. It says, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. I want you to pay attention to something in this, in this verse. Think about where, where that wind, that sound of a violent wind came from. It says here that it came from heaven. It didn't come from within ourselves. It wasn't a deeper understanding of your true self. It was not that you suddenly felt empowered because you realized that you're 
good enough. It was the spirit that came from heaven. It was a gift of God. But not only that, but it's a gift of God that drove them out. I think a lot of times we'd like to think that what happens is the spirit fills us and gives us this new deeper, richer spirituality that will bring us up into the heavens and help us understand the oneness of it all. But that is not what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God bears witness to the power of God at work in Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit enables us to bear witness to what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Now, When the disciples went out, when Peter went out, and they started talking, what happened was people were confused and perplexed. Two times in the passage, we're told that people heard what was happening, they heard that it was in their own language, and it says both times they they were perplexed. They were wondering what was going on. They didn't quite understand. Some people were interested, some people were skeptical. There were people who wanted to hear more, there were other people who thought they were drunk. But everybody, was a little bit perplexed. They were perplexed because why would be people be acting like this? I think it's instructive for those of us who believe that the Holy Spirit is at work in empowering us and empowering his church. That just because we're speaking with the power of the Holy Spirit does not mean that the rest of the world's gonna go, well, that's the Spirit, I guess they must be right. But instead, people will respond with skepticism, with mockery, with total lack of understanding. People will be perplexed, and it's true. You know, as a matter of fact, they think if people don't look at the church and what the church is doing and feel like, what the heck are those people up to? It means we're probably not doing it quite right. Think about it. This is the final week of our Sunday school for the year, and you think about the fact that we have a significant number of dedicated people who every Sunday morning either get up early or stay later than they would have to so that they can tell other people's kids about Jesus and how much God loves them. Now, if you think about it rationally, who would do that? Or think about this, that there are people who take their valuable vacation time from work and they spend it going to the Caribbean, but not to St. John's or St. Martin's, but they're going to Haiti to work with the world's poorest people. Or think about the fact that we have people who take their precious vacation time and they go to serve with 20 high school students in Boston. Or they go out to Johnstown with middle school students, for crying out loud, for a whole week, using your vacation. Or think about the fact that in a few weeks, we're going to have 200 screaming elementary age kids here, and there are going to be about 100 people who instead of going home and enjoying a nice cold beverage on their deck, rush here after work, or wrap everything up from their day, and they come here in the evening, and they sit, and they pray, and they sing, and they walk with these 200 screaming kids when they could be doing literally almost anything else. What kind of person does that? That there are people who look at their family's budget and they say the first 10%, goes to the Lord's work in this place because we know that that's what God wants of us. If you told your neighbors that, they would think you're nuts. Think about the fact that there are communities, churches like this one, where people from our community could walk in the door any day of the week They could sit down, they could talk to one of our pastors, they could talk to one of our deacons, and they can tell us all the stuff that's wrong, and then finally they get to the point that their financial life is a total disaster, and that they've fallen $1,000 behind on their electric bill, and it's going to get shut off, and they come and they ask us, and there's a very good chance that we will give them money to help keep the electric on, even though we have no connection, no relationship. We don't know how they got in this situation, and it's not even the most important question, but there is one thing that we tell them. 
we say, the thing you have to know is that there are no strings attached and you do not have to pay us back. This is a gift from God's people. What kind of people do that? The kind of people who are animated and empowered and driven out by the Spirit of God. But here's the thing, and this is the thing I think that sometimes we miss. It is great to do all these things. It's great when people wonder, what the heck is going on there? But in Acts chapter 2, the crowd saw what they were doing, and they were perplexed, and they wondered. And what it led to was it led to Peter standing up on behalf of all the disciples and saying something about it, telling them why, telling them that it's not just that they're do-gooders, but they, that, that they are people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God who's driven them out into the world to make a difference, to tell people about the love that God has for each person. That's what animated them, and that's what Peter told them. As a matter of fact, it was when everyone thought that they were drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning that motivated Peter to get up. He's like, wait, 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 we're not crazy. Instead, I'm going to tell you this comes from the Word of God. And then he, he quoted from this passage in Joel. And here's what it said. It said, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. I, I, in those days I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So when you think about what Peter said, what he quoted from the book of Joel, and what he told them about what the Lord is doing and the pouring out of his spirit, it's pretty remarkable. And it's remarkable because it's so incredibly open and so incredibly inviting and so incredibly including of everybody. Think about who's included. He says, in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All people are possible recipients this power of the Lord. Then it says, young men will dream dreams and old men will see visions. I will pour out my spirit on sons and daughters, even on slaves. So here's the challenging part. If no one is exempt from experiencing the animating and empowering power of the Holy Spirit that's been given to us, That means that nobody here can say that the Spirit has not gifted and empowered you if you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior. That means you cannot say, I'm only six years old. God can't use me. God says that he pours out his Spirit on sons and daughters. You can't say, well, God can't use me, because I'm too old. The Spirit says that that young men will dream dreams and old men will see visions. You can't say you're too old for the Spirit to use you and fill you. You can't say, I'm too poor. I, I don't have the financial resources to be a witness. The Spirit says that even on his slaves he will pour out his Spirit. That means every single person here has been gifted and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do God's work and to share the good news through what we do and also through what we say and how we live. That our lives are to bear witness to God's goodness and God's grace and God's love. And there is no excuse. But it's this incredibly broad and open, wonderfully open vision of the kingdom But there's also this wonderfully specific vision of the kingdom. Peter says, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The beautifully open part is that the Spirit will be given to everyone who calls out. The very specific part is we need to call out on the name of the Lord. And then we will be saved. And then we will receive this gift of the Spirit. So after Peter preaches this sermon, there's this response from everybody. They, they think they need to do something, and they do. And here's what it says. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I hope as you see this passage, you hear there are two things happening here. There's an invitation, and there's a promise. The invitation is this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Now, many of us have been baptized. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to continually have our baptismal vows renewed and restored and be reminded that in baptism we belong to Jesus Christ and who among us doesn't need to repent? You know, the reality is, and I've told you this before, that this word repent, you know, in English we have this way of thinking about it. We often think that repent means saying I'm sorry. Like, I repent, I'm sorry I did this. And then you kind of let it go at that. But when you look in the Greek in the New Testament, this word repent is actually much more active and much more powerful than that. The word in Greek is this word metanoia, which actually means to turn around and to go in a different direction. So what Peter says is, turn around each one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The invitation here is that we would turn around, that we go in a different direction. And I know, for, I know for certain that there are some of you who are here today who know that you are going the wrong direction. You know it's true. Today, the Spirit of God is speaking to you and calling to you and telling you it's time to turn around and go in a new direction. Listen to my voice. There are some people today who I know are lost. And what this passage tells us, what the Spirit is saying is, turn around and come home. But attached to this invitation, there's also a promise. That when you turn around and walk toward the Lord, it says, your sins will be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This same Spirit that fell upon Jesus' disciples and the apostles in that room in Jerusalem is here in our midst today. That same Spirit that fell on them and blew them out the door is here falling on us, blowing us out the door. That same spirit that empowered them to bear witness to the love of God in Jesus Christ, not just with their actions, but also with their words, is empowering you to bear witness to the good news of the love of God in Jesus Christ through what you do and through what you say. That same spirit that empowered them is here empowering us today. You ever read something like Acts chapter 2 and say, man, I wish the Spirit worked like that. The Spirit does work like that. The Spirit is working like that today with us. You know, one of the things that happens when God's spirit's, Spirit moves is that God's people move. When God's Spirit is moving, you can't just stay in your seat When God's spirit is moving, we get up and we get to work in Jesus' name. When God's spirit is moving, our eyes are open and we see that we're going the wrong direction. We hear his voice and call to repent and we turn and we go the other way. And that's the work of God's spirit. When God's spirit is working, we speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. When God's spirit is working, we give generously because we know that everything we have is a gift. When God's Spirit is moving, we find ourselves empowered to change the world by telling people about God's life-changing power that's at work in us. What happens when the Spirit moves? When the Spirit moves, 
He moves us. And we get going. And our lives are changed and our world is changed by the power of God, by his grace and his mercy in Jesus Christ.